Working on CRTs can be dangerous and if not lethal. You should not attempt to open up or fix any CRT without having good understanding of safety precautions. I am not responsible for any harm or damage done to anyone or anything. After all, this video is just a visual diary of my progress. And finally, if you have epilepsy or photosensitivity, I do not recommend you watch this video. So I've had my BVM 20F1 for a couple of years now and it's served me well in my virtue for 15kHz bliss as it's arguably one of the best standard depth displays ever made with 900 TV lines across 20 inches. Now I like to rotate through my CRTs every 6 months or so to keep my setup looking varied and fresh. That way I can still enjoy my other sets rather than treating them solely as backups. My BVM has done just over 75,000 hours, yet there's absolutely nothing wrong with the tube. It's not dim, colours are vivid, and the picture's sharp. Hours on a BVM aren't an indication of hours remaining, and it always gets overstated that a tube's life is only 30,000 hours. What a lot of people mistake this number for is when colour accuracy for production and broadcast may fall out of tolerance back when they're used in these working environments. So anyway, when I pulled out the BVM after not having it powered on for some time, I turned it on and this is what I saw. This happened every time I turned it on, but it would eventually go away after about 2 minutes, so my suspicion was failing capacitors. And it just so happens that around the same time, I saw someone post in the Aussie CRT Facebook group about the exact same monitor which was showing the same startup issues. This is where my virtue began to see if I could get this baby in the best possible working condition given its age. I got in touch with Savon Pat, the infamous Sony technician in the US, and he was advising me on possible causes and it was going to be a matter of trial and error to isolate the issue. I want to take this opportunity to say what an absolute gentleman Patrick is, as he would always respond to my constant questions, even being on opposite sides of the world. Thanks Pat. He told me to troubleshoot by unplugging any additional input cards from the monitor, but the issue still remained. By the way, the first three cards from the right as well as the ISR board on the left are essential for this monitor to run. If one of these boards is missing, it won't work. So on Pat's advice, I ordered the power board cap kit and installed that. However, it did nothing to fix the issue. Pat's recap kits are designed to partially recap these boards to either upgrade the capacitor value or to target the more likely troubled components given his wealth of experience. And seeing that I had a partially recap power board, and the issue still persisted, I went ahead and ordered the rest of the caps and installed them. And then, this was the first time powering on the fully recap power board. F I checked the caps that I installed and yep, I put one in the wrong way, opposite polarity. So I fixed that and put in a fresh 3.15 amp 250 volt fuse, but it still made the normal bonk de gore sound, but then would shut off from another blown fuse. I removed the power board top metal shielding in case something was shorting to it, installed a new fuse, and lo and behold, it powered on. At the time, I thought it was the metal shielding causing a short, but the next day when I went to power on the monitor, still without the shielding, it blew another fuse. I had a suspicion that maybe these fuses, although the same rating and ceramic type as the old ones, weren't as tolerant to the surging current that's only exhibited on startup. So instead of having my very own arcade monitor that takes fuses instead of coins every time I wanted to play, I purchased a handful of higher rated 4.0 amp 250 volt ceramic fuses, and after that, the monitor is turned on normally the first time and every other time. Alright, enough about fuses. My startup issues still persisted even after the power board and its daughter boards were recapped. In my talks with another 20F1 owner, they linked me to a video that showed someone fixing an issue that they had with jitter on the same model BVM. Now I do recall seeing this phenomena back when I was messing around with downscaling high resolution video to 240p using two Extron devices. 
This was the first time I had my eyes so close to the screen to see the magic downscaling in action. But I was so unimpressed by the distracting vertical jitter at the time, and I blamed it on the Extron devices doing something weird with sync. But now that I look closely on a raw 240p source, I see the same jitter. So I jumped back on Mauser to order the capacitors for the deflection board labelled D and E. I found an absolute vital Excel spreadsheet on the Pro Monitor CRT Facebook group that listed every capacitor on every board for this monitor, including their size. I made sure every capacitor was the same diameter or smaller than the original, and I tried to get quality brands like Nichicon, Rubicon, and Panasonic. I'd select the highest temperature, ripple current, and operating hours. I figured the only negative to this is cost, and I'm realistically only ever going to do this once, so why not go all out? So a fresh set of caps arrived, and I got to work fixing the D board first, which all but one capacitor were SMD. I've recapped a handful of Game Gear systems in the past, so I'm no stranger to these type of caps, and I've found signs of leakage under most of them. If you've worked with leaking caps before, then you'll know the smell. Stanky fishy, stanky fishy, stanky fishy. Now assuming that the solder pads underneath these caps hadn't been eaten by electrolytic fluid, my method to change these were to twist until the legs came out from the caps, then I would remove the legs from the board with some fresh solder and use a solder wick to clean the solder cap fluid concoction. Doing it this way meant that each SMD cap would take me about 2 minutes to change. I came in with some 99% alcohol and a toothbrush to neutralise and clean the electrolytic fluid, and then added some fresh solder to the pads. And for God's sake, don't mess up the polarity. I was replacing about 5 caps at a time and testing the card in the monitor in between to make it easier to backtrack any mistakes I might have made. And as I got quicker and more confident, I was testing about every 10 to 20 caps instead. So after I fully recapped the D board, I wanted to see if it had fixed any of the jitter. And I was really impressed that it was almost completely gone. So I recapped the E board, plugged it all back in, and the jitter's more or less obliterated, and any slight movement that remains I would put down to just the nature of analog video. I was so happy that I finally was seeing some progress, so I moved on to the BK board. This board has RGBS inputs, but it also processes all video from other input cards as it connects directly to the neck board. This board in particular has a lot of SND caps, and by now I receive my ESR meter, which reads the capacitance and ESR to assess the health of a capacitor. At this point, I was changing every single cap because even if I narrowed the issue down to a single or a group of caps, the remaining are still destined to fail at some point, so why not change them all now? So it made no difference whether I tested the caps or not, but I tested a few along the way just for my own learning. This meter can apparently test caps in and out of circuit, how accurately I'm not sure, but every single SMD cap was showing some ridiculous capacitance even after discharging. And the electrolytic fluid that was leaking out of most of them goes to show, and one in particular was eating away at the solder mask. And after three hours, I plugged the BK board in, and what a sight to see this baby power on with absolutely zero visual noise. After this I recapped the PA board, which when you're facing the monitor it's on the left side, and this to my understanding is an overload protection circuit. My monitor would show an overload light on a solid white screen when the brightness was cranked too high, and I found that after the PA board was recapped, the brightness can be pushed even higher before lighting up the overload light. After recapping, I have so much better geometry and tighter convergence. After all, recapping the deflection and video boards have essentially restored the circuits back to factory spec, assuming there's no degradation in other components. As amazing as my BVM's looking at this point, I realised I don't have full alignment and convergence controls that are otherwise stated in the manual. And I'm guessing my firmware was corrupt, or that it's an earlier 1.10 revision, because I found online a preservation of the 1.40 firmware. So I ordered an identical replacement programmable chip and found a company interstate to program it at a very reasonable price. Thankfully these ICs can just come out with a flathead screwdriver and pop the new one in place. After slotting the ISR board back, I now have full horizontal static convergence controls for each section of the screen, 
as well as top and bottom vertical convergence. This was really impressive, and I immediately started taking photos of Artemio's test suite trench coat guy. And when I zoomed in on my phone, I noticed the misconvergence. So I adjusted the horizontal and vertical static convergence, and I immediately saw a bump in sharpness. By now, nothing was excessive in making this monitor look as close to perfect as possible. So I bought a 10 times magnification lens with a manual focus, but maybe I should have gotten the 30 times lens in hindsight. I was recording all footage with an iPhone X, and it does a crap job of macro shots. The goal here is to have the red, green, and blue phosphors lined up uniformly, both on the horizontal and vertical axis. With the new extended menu, you repeat this process until every dot is pinpoint. This BVM was made in 1995, so naturally it was a little dusty, so I loosened the dirt with a soft paintbrush and used an air blower to clean it out. Next I wanted to re-grease the anode cap to help insulate it. Most if not all CRTs have some sort of grease to prevent high voltage seeping from under the cap. This actually happened on a consumer set that I owned and I think the moisture produced from my evaporative cooler catalyzed it further. I can't stress the importance enough of knowing what you're doing when working on a CRT. Remember, this is not a tutorial, just a documentation of my work. So I squeezed the anode cap and shorted it on the metal shielding whilst making sure I wasn't grounding myself. I applied some dielectric grease and put it all back together. Finally, I wanted to make sure that my new caps and all the other components ran a lot cooler than ever. So I mounted not one, but two exhaust fans inside the BVM. In this BVM, there's plenty of room to mount an exhaust fan at the top, and the top's somewhat isolated from the rest of the monitor because of this plastic bracket. So because of that, I put a smaller fan on the back plate next to the deflection board, which gets the hottest. I tried powering from an internal 5 volt source, but it caused rippling on the screen, and I know I could have used passive components to filter and smooth the voltage, but I had to poke a wire out the back anyway for the variable fan speed switch, so it just made sense to power it externally. So to recap, the D and E boards fixed the vertical jitter, and the BK board completely emitted the startup strobing. The PA board allowed the brightness to subjectively go higher before tripping the overload light, and upgrading the firmware gave me full service menu options. This monitor is looking better than I could have ever imagined, and it really brings out the quality that broadcast monitors are touted for having an edge over the PVM series. I wanted to document all of this because there wasn't much I could find in my research on fixing particular issues, and these monitors need maintenance to see them working in the future. Thanks all for watching. Happy gaming.